So I'm the first of those two. I'm Peter Ellis. I manage the sector performance team at the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Most of what I'd be talking about today was things that happened uh, back when I was the manager of the Tourism Research and Evaluation Team. Um, there's, obviously, as you all know, there's been a restructure in the, in the last 12 months or so as four departments have merged. Most of those tourism data functions are now part of uh, my new team, the sector performance team, and uh, we're taking on some of those techniques to develop the tourism data for a much broader sort of set. Um, we've got an obscene number of slides today, so I'll sort of scoop through them. Um, what we're going to talk about, first of all, is uh, we'll do a bit of a, a tag team approach. I'm going to talk a bit about how we assess needs and why we ended up with R as opposed to another package uh, at, at MB for the tourism data. Ian will talk similarly about uh, those issues of um, conservation. Um, then I'm going to uh, talk about an example of using R actually in the production of official statistics. So not just in uh, uh, analysis at the end, but how R got integrated into, into the production cycle of a new series, which we indicated. And we'll talk a bit about later, but there's now at least three uh, important official statistics series which we produce at MB, where R is right in the heart of the cycle. Uh, Ian will talk a bit about uh, training some of the staff at MB uh, uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so. He's been heavily involved in some of that training. And perhaps together we'll talk a bit about reviewing some of that progress and looking forward. Just to uh, the background of what we're talking about here, um, back in 2011, tourism data, we spent about $4 million a year producing this stuff and analysing it uh, for policy purposes and, and also publishing it uh, for the industry and others, academics and others to use. It basically ranges from counting your departure cards to leave the country, a whole range of complex surveys, uh, surveys of tourists, surveys of businesses, uh, we're increasingly bringing some administrative data into the mix as well. It's basically a combination of in-house, uh, uh, contracted out, and Statistics New Zealand doing a fair bit for us. So there's, there's at least a dozen serious, uh, series here. Um, Statistics New Zealand is some, some of the larger ones, are the ones we manage ourselves. In 2011, the old Ministry of Tourism had just been merged into what was then the Ministry of Economic Development was poised to go through a major change. You know, reviewing the tourism data in particular, there was a sense that it wasn't meeting all the needs and we had to um, uh, basically uh, go through a process of changing the content of, of, the, of the data. So when we did that review of uh, what, uh, what sort of content we're producing, surveys, how we really needs and so on, it also drew our attention to, uh, frankly, a bit of a mess in the data management side, which uh, we inherited from the Ministry of Tourism days. Now, anyone who's looking at this will immediately spot a number of very odd things. One of the oddest is that we're actually using SPSS to store a lot of the data. There's also a whole pile of data which was stored in Excel. And this question mark stands for data which we didn't actually store at all, but was probably sitting on the consultant's computer in Auckland. So this was the uh, situation in terms of where the data was being stored. It was disseminated via a range of tools by this uh, uh, basic market research firm, InfoTools, uh, which provide uh, various forms of cross-tabulation either on desktops or via the web. We also used uh, Supercross, which uh, Stats New Zealand users will be familiar with. In the end, the actual analysis was being done by Excel. So what was, what was happening here was, for example, a typical <coughs> workflow was that people would be, um, data was stored in SPSS, had been converted into a format that was used by one of these cross-tabulation tools, which could do like basic cross-tabs. And if they produce a cross-tab, and the team would download that into Excel and use that to, to uh, produce graphs and things of that sort. Now, there are major problems with this. Obviously, there's big issues with the archiving of the data and the storage of the data and version control and so on. There's very severe limitations on relying on Excel for your analysis. And um, there are also a, a number of uh, uh, quality control issues with this as well. All of this stuff from the right onwards is point and click. Very difficult to peer review uh, what, what people have done. Very difficult to reproduce anything to do quality control. So apart from the limitations on uh, what you can get out of Excel, there were, there were some uh, rather serious 
inefficiencies and, and risks basically associated with that sort of setup. So some of the things which we couldn't do, those were really basic things which, which come in and assess the situation we thought you need to be able to do if you're going to be serious about our statistics. Um, we couldn't do basic inference uh, from some of our complex surveys. What we've got here is the International Visitors Survey. These are 95% confidence intervals for the year-on-year -year change in total spend or average spend by the different countries. So we've got, uh, for instance, you can see year-on-year the -year, uh, China total spend going up very significantly, but the uh, mean spend uh, not so much. Horizontal bars showing 95% confidence intervals. Very standard sort of thing. With the setup we had before, we basically didn't have uh, people with the skills or the tools to do it. SPSS, this was, this was a, sort of a shock, it was turned out when SPSS deals with weighted data, data that's been weighted to the population, it interprets the weights as frequencies. So it can't actually uh, return a standard error or anything based on that, unless you buy extra additional expensive modules. We couldn't do basic things like a, a chart with the uh, points label. It's the number one request for an enhancement to Excel. I don't know why Microsoft don't do it, but you just cannot uh, use text or something in, in, a, in a graphic in this way. Um, we couldn't do seasonal adjustment. And the other thing which this slide shows here, this is seasonally adjusted uh, visitor arrivals to New Zealand. You can see the spike for the Rugby World Cup and the dip for the Asian economic crisis and so on. Um, with the reliance and point and click tools, we couldn't uh, do something like this and easily update it, just repeat it as the new data comes out, in this case from Stats New Zealand every month. We had no text mining capacity, no ability to do things like count the number of words in a, in a, in a document and turn it into images. What we're seeing here is uh, reported disappointments from Chinese visitors compared to other visitors. Word clouds are often a bit of a gimmick, but in this case, we use the power of graphics to sort of show uh, a, a comparison. You can see that the Chinese visitors have got a much wider range of complaints than the uh, normal run. And uh, whereas normal, uh, it's a normal, sorry, non-Chinese visitors, uh, <laughs> folks on the web are expensive. There's a whole range of quality words which are coming up indicating the Chinese experience. So until we started introducing some of these new tools, uh, we, we basically had this very rich set of, of commentated comments that weren't being analysed. Other things we couldn't do back in 2011, basic modelling. Here's a, a straightforward um, uh, econometric model showing the relationship between the nights to have spent here and how much they spend, presenting it nicely in a way that can easily communicate to the public or a minister so you can see the diminishing marginal extra spend as extra nights come in. Do you see a point, where, for instance, uh, once you've been here about 100 days, it doesn't matter how long you are, people seem to spend about the same amount. So we, can we can estimate those sorts of things. This is the sort of analysis and presentation which we couldn't do in our previous tool set. Nice infographics involving maps and so on. Uh, not so nice infographics doing network analysis and so on. But point at some of the more sophisticated things that we wanted to do. In this case, we wanted to look at uh, how much of the flows from one region to another within New Zealand, and can we uh, work out if you like, the strength of the connections and present that? It's a moderately sophisticated sort of thing to do. Techniques have existed since the 1950s to do it, but obviously, with our setup, we weren't able to do it. But of course, most importantly, we couldn't do animated hand drawn graphics that little dancing manner. So, we knew something needed to change. And um, we basically looked through uh, options. At this point, I myself never actually touched that. So we, um, we looked at SAS. SAS was involved in some of our data production. Um, good reputation, very solid. Statistics New Zealand like it. Uh, weaknesses were the graphics, which were very important to us, and the cost, and frankly, the learning curve. It's not really much easier to learn than, um, than R, even now with the existence of Enterprise Guide and other things. SPSS, at first, we, knew, we assumed would be the one, but when you found out how weak it is analytically and how much you have to spend for extra modules to do what we regarded as basic tasks, that, that, that was ruled out. For a while, we really thought we'd go with Starter. It's very cheap. 
econometricians like it. Other people at economic development were using it for econometric analysis. Um, it was, it, it's lacking in its ability to deal with more than one rectangle of data. So as the data starts getting a little bit complex, we, uh, you start getting some issues there. And so in the end, we actually percolated to our, was actually our fourth choice after testing those first, first uh, three. Basically, it was free, it's got the best graphics, it's got the best implementations of all the latest cutting edge stuff. And uh, on the downside, it's a bit intimidating. There's uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, particularly from network engineers about if it's open source and free, is it really going to be safe? We, we worked through those things, and we'll talk a bit about that, that later. Just some of what we're looking at here, though. So this is assessing the number of packages which are added on to R. There's now more than 4,000 uh, added packages which can get, as you can see, they're growing at an enormous rate. On one assessment, the capability of R in the last year has grown more than the entire capability of SAS is in, in total over its history. Um, we're in a situation where it's techniques developed in academia. Um, R basically dominates. The, the, the new methods are there in R. They're published on websites to complement that. There's many things which, of course, SAS could do, but as a matter of fact, they just aren't. So if you want to do it in SAS, you're reduced to writing it yourself. If you want to do it in R, you just search the web and you find someone who's done it for you. In this plot, we're seeing the decline at the top there of, in the citations of both SPSS and SAS in the academic literature. And uh, the smaller packages with R at the front are, um, are, are taking off. And you know, basic predictions suggest that by 2015 or so, there'll be more academic citations of R than of SAS and SPSS. But where R really takes off is in the global uh, user community. See, there's more than 400 blogs actively devoted to R, um, only about 40 on SAS. Um, these are, uh, up here we've got um, email uh, discussion list posts. So a few years ago, R overtook SAS as the most common uh, subject on, on statistical email lists. Uh, platform. The bottom left, there's an interesting decline in those emails there. One of the things that's happening is that email discussion lists have been replaced with more bottom social media type things. Um, uh, Stack Exchange is probably the main one. And so if we see here the, the absolute dominance of R on the uh, Stack Overflow for programmers and cross validated for, uh, which is a Q&A site on statistics. We see that um, in the around 2009, SAS was um, up, up there with R, but R just kept expanding in terms of its popularity on the Stack Overflow side. Um, most commonly cited used tool by, uh, by data scientists and um, machine learning. Where is all the activity? Started in New Zealand, but it's now well and truly global, huge in both uh, the USA in particular, but it's a very big in Europe and a growing number of Asian users. So that's, uh, that's sort of roughly where we came to the point of, okay, we're going to invest in R, we want this capability. We'll talk later about how we did it, and, uh, but first Ian will talk a bit about Doc. So the, uh, it's interesting, the whole art kind of thing, because uh, uh, when um, we first contracted Ian to come and do uh, some training, he suggested, based on his Doc experience, that we use R Commander the staff, I was very resistant at first, and basically I thought they just needed to harden up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, get, get used to writing code, and uh, um, uh, I suppose I was worried that they sort of get addicted to this, this GUI. But our commander seems to have just the right balance that, although it does help people use these things, it's actually not that pleasant to use. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and it really does direct people's attention to, gosh, this is, this is really simple, isn't it? And so I, I had people who basically never written code before in their lives, uh, within a few weeks of using R Commander, were very quickly making this transition, the enormous power that you get. And I, I also have to say that the, um, uh, we, the very strong, heavy Wickham flavor we use with our R, which basically means ggplot for graphics and uh, reshape and plier, for uh, data management has made a huge difference as well because it, uh, you know, if you look at R five years ago, there was, it was all very esoteric and if you wanted to build a graph, you could do amazing things, but you build it up almost by you know, more components. 
the grammar of brackets uh, gives you a very powerful thing around that, and uh, reshape library does as well. So look into those things if you haven't already. Back to the tourism data, and this is where we are at. Where we want to move something that looks more like uh, this. We're looking at storing data, popping in the database. It doesn't really matter which brand it is, it's going to be a database that stores this stuff. We want dissemination to happen via nz.stat. So, you know, we're, it's quite open. We're in discussions with Stats New Zealand around this, but one stop shop, common tools, big investment being made in this, this powerful platform that Stats New Zealand has. Let's use it for disseminating our data as well rather than going through third party uh, priorities. We're not going to declare war on Excel because we know we'll lose. End users want to use the thing, but we, want, but we need them to be doing it in a way that's going to be sort of controlled, that will perhaps speak meaningfully to us in the databases, and, uh, um, and for the serious stuff, the, the sort of things that my team are doing, we want to have a connection direct to the database and, and doing things through R. So this is this model we're working towards. So far, we've only got one uh, of our data series in this format, but over the next six months, basically, we've got a big transition program <coughs> where everything will be um, working this way. What we have at the moment is what I'm about to talk about is the regional tourism indicators, and where, at the moment, R is a crucial part of the um, data production. It may well go from the production angle when we get into a state like here, because things which we currently do in R, we might use the database tools to do and, and feed it on. What was crucial was that in this 18 month development process which we had, um, R gave us unprecedented ability to experiment with how the production would work. So, regional tourism indicators was one of the two top priorities of the content change from that 2011 review I was referring to. It's basically world first use of electronic transactions to try and work out where tourists go. Uh, in the country, rather than relying on survey data. Uh, it's given us unprecedented reliability and validity. We purchased the data from banks and credit card clearing houses. It was a major job of our 80 months to, to develop it. Um, uh, we first uh, got Barton Jenkins in to do some prototyping. The, the work really took off once we started buying the data ourselves. We were able to whack it in the database and start analysing it. What we're at now is what we call the third wave of these. We're uh, about to finish a um, uh, process whereby we match these data, calibrate them to the national accounts and to some of our survey data so we can account for the way that uh, different nationalities use credit cards, different <coughs> amounts, different industries have different uses of credit cards, use iterative proportional fitting to get uh, regional estimates and all of that. Relatively sophisticated stuff. It's only been possible because we've been able to develop it so flexibly in R. The sorts of things which, um, which we can do now with this data, we can, uh, uh, we can locate within the regions where growth is happening in tourism. So we've got a blue to red choropleth map here. The size of the uh, circles is proportionate to the total spend in each of those regions. You can see, obviously, a big mass of red from the United Kingdom. We knew all about that already. It was a declining market. But we can see that, okay, it's a bit heavier in Christchurch and so on. But what was news for us here was that this massive growth which is happening in China, actually, if the Rotorua, which is one of the biggest Chinese markets, the traditional Chinese market uh, where they go to is actually declining. It's sort of new information from this data. Uh, we can, we can uh, track by different industries you look at the different seasonalities in different industries, or how seasonality varies in different regions. Uh, and in this case, this is some of the data we've matched the national accounts. We can look at actual dollar spend, uh, so on. And this is this is an example of a GT pop graphic with very powerful and straightforward um, facets. One of the things, ten things people might be interested in, um, GT pop works on this basis that you have an aesthetic, we talk about the X and Y position, a, a geom, well, in this case we've got line geoms, which are actually painting things. There's also the concept of statistical transformation. So for this, we wrote a statistical transformation, which basically does a little bit of seasonal adjustment. Now when we want to add a seasonally adjusted line to one of these graphs, we just tell it, add the stack SA transform, and it will do it for each of the different combinations or facet or color that we've asked it to. 
that's immensely powerful once you start using, using these tools this way. What did I contribute? Basically, it was very flexible. It allowed us to produce, to produce over 500 different uh, things, uh, plots and so on, during the data validation exercise, uh, which then turned into high quality presentation graphics. Um, gave us very flexible experimenting with reports. When we started out on this, we were actually using database reporting tools uh, recommended by the architect. They just didn't cut it in terms of their speed and the flexibility which we could develop things. Basically, though, R has a reputation for struggling with large data, used in, in conjunction with a, a relational database that uh, is actually, you know, blisteringly fast compared to the, the other tools we're using. Of course, other, other stats packages would, would be fast as well, but um, in the production, what we've done is we've been able to use it to automate the actual dissemination products, the things which go on the web and things which go to the stakeholders, one page summaries for each of their regions produced as a nice PDF for them. We've also been able to use it to automate the data checking. So, for instance, we do a forecast. Um, I'll just uh, scoot on to that. Every, every month when we're getting the new data, we fit the time series to over 500 of the different individual series, which we're getting here, the different industries and regions and so on. And we compare what's come in that month with the forecast for what we expect for that. Um, we run it through some simple checks there. Well, one of the results which came out, which were a bit surprising, produced a nice little plot, and, and uh, the analyst has it after five seconds of processing a bunch of these things, which tells us basically, okay, in this case, fuel retailing has come out as being less than we would have thought this month. And on the other hand, casino operations has come out slightly more. Um, the, we've, we've mapped the size of those points to the actual scale of, of things well, so there's an instant sense of, well, does this matter? Casino operations doesn't because domestically there's very little, which is interesting on that. Um, where, and so the, basically the power of something which is code-based and you can tell it to run 500 models and tell us which ones come up with surprising results is a, a very big addition to our checking and validation. The real emphasis on graphics in the um, in uh, in our was uh, also very powerful for uh, doing many many checks. We identified problems. Here we had a problem in the data at one point, and it's a fairly obvious one. But the um, the ease with which you can turn the data into graphics helps work that out. Um, we produce many hundreds of these sorts of plots as part of our validation process. Basically, once you, you've got it down, say, okay, we, we know we want to compare the, the new data to such and such a survey, it's, it's very straightforward to, to adapt your code and start doing this sort of thing. So, um, uh, also, you, you, things get adapted into presentation graphics, relatively straightforward to produce this sort of thing, animated perspective plots and things of that sort. Obviously, very nice to show to the end users who like a bit of color and motion. In this case, we've got the um, tourism intensities. That's spend per population. So the higher it is, the uh, more that is. So you can see a little bit of the seasonality. Like there's a, a winter season peak down there in the South Island, as well as the summer season peak, which occurs everywhere. And uh, it's not a great analytical graphic, but it's certainly a nice way of presenting things. So um, that's, that's it from me on some of that. I suppose what I would just summarize there is that uh, though we came to R because we needed something to calculate confidence intervals from surveys, if SPSS couldn't, we've ended up using it actually much more than we thought we would, including uh, really integrating into some of our data checking and validation, and basically into the production of, of some quite serious statistics. I'll hand over to Ian on how some of that might have happened.